sparse matrix computations for an algorithm still widely used called partial reorthogonalization. His career has been in scientific computing, and to name one particular thing that he did that I teach every time I teach CS267, something called recursive spectral bisection. How do you take a graph and break it up into pieces? And one year I taught that, and one of um, Jitendra's students, uh, uh, Zhi, took it uh, and, and made a very big splash in, in graphics because of doing that and in, in dividing up images. So, so Horst's background is in sparse matrix computations, but since 1996, he's been in charge of the largest Department of Energy unclassified supercomputer center in the United States, which is at NERSC. And he's very familiar with scientific computing. He's one of the people in charge of the top 500 list, keeping charge of the fastest supercomputers in the, in the world every six months. I think it's updated. And so today we're going to get this overview of supercomputing. Thank you, Jim. Do I have the microphone right? OK. It's a great pleasure to be here. And since Jim mentioned the top 500 list, I want to mention one other important contribution that connects me to Soda Hall and ECS and in particular with respect to the top 500 list that um, I taught or co-taught with David Collard CS267 I think it was in 1997 or 1998 and at that time the now cluster or the subsequent now cluster with about 130 140 or maybe 240 Sun workstations was here in Soda Hall and I pushed really hard to get this system on the top 500 list. And lo and behold, with a lot of work and effort, some students who were in the class worked on that cluster and got a LIMPAC benchmark result on the top 500. So great. Now, what does that mean? It has, I think, a long-term significant place in history because now, uh, seven or eight years later, PC clusters are dominating the top 500 list. And anybody who is presenting a chart on PC clusters and how they took over the supercomputing world will show that the very first PC cluster that made the top 500 list was here, somewhere here, this direction, I guess, <laughs> in Soda Hall. So that's another interesting factoid about the last 20 years. And uh, I would like to sort of give you a perspective, my perspective on the last 20 years. And the reason was that there, I attended a conference in Heidelberg that is 20 years old, uh, old and so they asked me to put this together. So going back to 1985, it is quite intriguing to look at a supercomputer in 1985 that was the Cray 2. I'd like to call these signpost systems because I think in each era there are certain systems that stand out because of their architectural accomplishments, because of their technological innovations. And clearly 20 years ago, a Cray 2 stood out. Um, and it's interesting to look at some of the parameters on why that was a special machine. It was uh, a four processor machine at this point. Cray had built some other four processor machines, but it was the first one with a very fast processor with a, a, a 244 megahertz processor, which was by far the fastest that was around except maybe some Japanese processors. It had these other characteristics. In particular, it had only 1.6 square meters floor space, 200 kilowatt power that was very small. It has this very, very remarkable liquid cooling system that made it a pleasure to look at. Um, and the interesting thing is, if we look 20 years later, actually the system that we have now is a signpost system, the Blue Gene system. Uh, you may have seen in the newspaper that the final configuration uh, was just dedicated last week at Lawrence Livermore Labs, and I haven't updated this completely. This is sort of the half size system, so what Livermore has dedicated is doubled that system one more time. So a couple of interesting things. If you look at the processor speed, that's only a 700 megahertz. That hasn't increased much at all. I mean, it's only a factor of two. Of course, I pointed out that the Cray 2 was very, very fast for its time. And this actually stepped backward, and it's actually using very slow processors, but a very large number, 65,000. So in terms of parallelism, we see a factor of 16,000 increase. And you can look at all the other factors. From a center management point of view, something that always moves uh, a lot of us even though it's not so interesting from a computer science point of view, is floor space and power. And you see that 250 square meters of floor space is significant, and 1.8 megawatt of power is very significant. And um, so you see that we've seen, if you look at LINPAC, a tremendous speed improvement, a factor of more than 100,000 as one measure of performance. So what I would like to talk about in the first part of my talk is how we got from 85 to 2005 and what happened. Architecture is just one piece. You can also look at sort of the environment that we worked 20 years ago and the environment we work today. And while none of those changes individually were dramatic increases, collectively, 
the supercomputing environment for over the last 20 years has changed really significantly. And uh, you would think of a 1985 version of an environment with a dump terminal where at best you had something like a VI editor, you had no visualization, you had no tools, you had, in a sense, vector Fortran environment. Uh, if you were remote accessing, it was at a low speed. There was still dial-up uh, available at this time. Actually, dial-up was, uh, was just about coming out of fashion. Um, and if you compare this to what we see today, there has been tremendous uh, improvement made in, in all these aspects of how a supercomputing environment is today. Actually, I think that uh, in, in many respects, a supercomputing environment today is not that much different from a desktop environment. I think that's my phone, which I have to ignore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, that's one of the major disimprovements over the last 20 years. <laughs> uh, so what I want to do is just say from more anecdotal basis on a, what I think are the top 10 accomplishments, sort of like a Letterman top 10 list, uh, which is more listed by impact and change in perspective as opposed to maybe by measurable scientific progress. But I, I'd like to make the point why these are important changes. And I'll just run through the first couple of them. And I want to put the top 500 list in on the NASCAR benchmarks. I was in both. They both had an impact. I think the top 500 list had quite a impact because it quantified a lot of the high-performance computing for the better or worse, but it made it very pol uh, sort of open to the public, very accessible, uh, a lot of debate, and it created a political dimension. For example, if you look at the debate three years ago about the Japanese Earth Simulator, without the top 500 list, that debate wouldn't have happened. Um, I'm skipping over some of these. If you want to ask me questions, please interrupt me and ask questions, because if I spend a minute or two on all of these, when we're falling way behind. Um, what you don't see on this list is something which I think is, of course, very important. These are tools like LinPack, IcePack, and then later on ScalarPack. The reason they're not on the list was because they were already accomplishments that go back to the late 60s and then through the 70s. So they just didn't meet my 20-year windows, but they are similar of importance to many of the other things. If you look at algorithmic uh, progress, the, these hierarchical algorithms were really the major progress in terms of multicrit, but also sparse matrix solvers. Anything. Uh, which is going away from the simplistic algorithms that were used in the era before, and that was a, a big impact. Um, this was a political factor. I think that in the early 90s, the HPCC initiative that was started in the US really made a big change in the way high-performance computing was done. And I believe that as a political statement, the HPC initiative was very, very successful because it established really the supremacy of the US computer industry in this field. But let me talk about the top five. And if you're opinionated, of course, I invite you to guess uh, if you see sort of a trend where I'm going, if you have some ideas what might be for number five. If anybody has a, a guess or suggestion, maybe I'll go to number five and then you see what, uh, what else is coming. So number five I put here is the attack of the killer micros. And this was a phrase that was coined by Eugene Brooks at the conference Supercomputing 89. Eugene is a a uh, computational scientist at Livermore, and he was in a panel discussion. The panel discussion was whether massively parallel systems will actually ever overtake the, at this time, traditional supercomputers of the Cray 2 or Cray YMP type. And he said, they will be all wiped out by the incredible attack of the killer micros, alluding, of course, to the famous late night movie, The Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. And so there's one thing we have to remember here is, is that a good catchy phrase sticks, and that phrase stuck a long time because it was a shorthand for something that was actually on the horizon and which in, in, in hindsight, of course, everybody said was the uh, inevitable development. And this was that CMOS microprocessors gained in the 80s because of architectural improvements in addition to the Moore's Law speed improvements significantly in terms of performance on supercomputers. And there was a gap that was eventually being closed. So what Eugene pointed out was that CMOS micros will eventually take over and win the supercomputing race, which, which at the end they did. Um, they did change the face of supercomputing. So what I mean by attack of the killer micros is simply the fact that CMOS micros took over. But they were not an inevitable or the only technology choice. In hindsight, it was very remarkable that basically what was used in a commercial technology for, in a sense, the burgeoning uh, desktop revolution with PCs, that that technology made its way into high-end supercomputing. Um, Number four, um, 
My number four accomplishment is Beowulf cluster. So I gave you the Berkeley version of this that now was here three or four years before Beowulf. So why do I put Beowulf up here? And I think that's also important to put this in perspective um, because what really set Beowulf apart from many other activities was that the software was made available as was sort of the early days of open source. The findings were communicated. There were tutorials which led to a book, how to build a Beowulf cluster. And so there was, in addition to just doing the basic research, a very, very important effort put forward by Thomas Sterling here with one of the first Beowulf clusters and his group. He was at that time at NASA Goddard. That really brought the way of building inexpensive cheap supercomputers out of PCs into the general public. And so it was democratizing to a certain extent supercomputing, made supercomputing generally available. And it was a big step towards what we see today in the high performance computing world. Uh, Thomas Sterling himself is actually very cognizant of that effect here, that it did also a lot of damage. Because what it did is, is it really created sort of the cheap and inexpensive technology that drove out the good. So it's always sort of the, the bad drives out the good or um, it also stopped architecture innovation for at least a decade. And I can ask you here, Paul here, how many of you are actually taking computer architecture classes and how many take software classes. And I think that architecture has become not that interesting because there are two or three vendors that dominate the market and there isn't that much which is done in architecture. So Beowulf clusters have done a lot of good, but also have done some damage. And actually, <coughs> Thomas Sterling at uh, another supercomputing conference in 2002 actually disowned his child, Beowulf, and said that was one of the foolishest things that he did, and it detracted from real supercomputing. So now I give you the top four, the number four, so now I come to number three. So now I go back and see if I have an audience poll that you see, so if where this is going, if you have any suggestions of technology, accomplishments that were done in the last 20 years in the high-end world uh, that you would like to put on the top five list. I would say my number three is sort of a little bit odd and you may not immediately think about it, but I will show it to you anyway now, and it's scientific visualization. And there was a definite time in 1987 where NSF commissioned this report on visualization in scientific computing that actually established the field. And what's important here is, is that visualization was really a change in point of view. It was not really a fundamentally a shift and not significantly new things have been accomplished. But what it is, it transformed really a sort of technology-driven subfield of computer science, that is computer graphics, into something which is a medium of communication. So visualization really introduced artistic elements and the communication element into something which was before visualization, the term was coined, the field was defined very much a um, very much computer science subfield and technology field. The role of visualization that's important is that there was a conceptual breakthrough to make the invisible visible. And I think I can explain this ver uh, very well with a simple example. Um, in the mid 80s, sci before scientific visualization was coined, this is how computational fluid dynamics uh, researchers displayed flow fields, vector fields. And so you have to think about it. These are people like us who are mathematically trained. And if you're mathematically trained and you think about a vector field, you think about a vector in a field. And so that's what you get. This is how you display vector fields, very simply put. Now this is 2D, this is black and white, these are line drawings, and vectors are used to display a vector field. And this was the standard way of doing things uh, into the 80s. Now, only a few years later, we get this one. This is out of, uh, taken from NCSA, the on one of the early visualizations of a thunderstorm uh, by Bob Wilhelmsen, the data provided in the NCSA visualization team, that's the University of Illinois team did this. So if you look at this, it's of course color, three dimensional, so the graphics hardware made similar big strides in this time, which was one big factor. But what you also see is a sort of creative way of using color. Intuitively, red are the updrafts, blue are the downdrafts, so you appeal to the intuition, of course, you don't see blue and red in the actual uh, thunder clouds. And uh, there are new technologies used like ribbons and tracers that are a more intuitive way of understanding vector fields as opposed to just drawing vectors. And so this was a very big progress in a very short period of time, as I said, from uh, say 87 to 92, only a couple, four or five years. Uh, it had very important impact 
oops, I shouldn't have shown you this. <laughs> it had very important impact on uh, how supercomputing, high performance computing was portraying its result in the general public. And of course, beautiful visualizations always help to convey somebody of the importance of the science done. So now if you look very quickly, you've seen my number two accomplishment. So it's unfortunately, I can't ask for a question, but my number two accomplishment is MPI, the complete reference. And I want to spend a couple more minutes on MPI because I think there's a little bit more we can learn about the interplay between computer science and high performance computing if we look at the history of MPI. Uh, that standard reference book was published, I believe, in 1992, was actually put together by, or 1993, was put together by a committee of people listed here and many more who defined the standard. Um, at that time, other efforts were out there in terms of parallel computing. I know, for example, Split C was very popular already at that time in Berkeley, which became the precursor to UPC. But why MPI? So I want to go back a little bit earlier to 1988. And in 1988, I attended a conference, the so-called Salishan Conference in Oregon, that happens annually, which is a by invitation only conference uh, for the Department of Energy and some associated federal agency researchers. And the 88 Salishan meeting was an unusual one because the organizers decided to hold a bake-off and invited four proponents of parallel programming languages. They are listed here, Sisal, Haskell, Unity, and Large Train Data Flow. And so I can uh, do the poll here since this is a real computer science department. Those of you who work in programming languages, are you familiar with any of those that are listed here? Have you ever heard of them? Yeah, Paul has, of course. <laughs> um, so. The interesting thing was John Feo published this actually as a book in MIT Press, which still is available, called The Salishan Problems. The idea was that those four programming language proponents were to implement five or six problems in their programming language and then communicate to sort of the scientific computing audience uh, that I was in how you would use that um, programming language to express parallelism. So that was, the point I want to make here is, is that there was a very significant research activity at, at this time. So there were many proponents, many different systems. There was a lot of active research. People were thinking about building compilers. Uh, it existed and was alive and thriving in computer science departments across the country. And the, f the sad fact is a lot of this early work on parallel programming languages has been all but forgotten. And I, I'll comment on this later. What I have here on the right just as an example is that just to put you in historical perspective, at that time, people actually went to conferences and I had to write a TERP report. And I wrote a six-page TERP report, which was still processed by a secretary, had to be signed off by my boss and then sent on a distribution list. So it seems to me unconceivable that something like this would happen today. I would just send an email to everybody. And, uh, but the, of course, the advantage is that I still found the TERP report, which, <laughs> 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 or, which helps me documenting what happened 20 years ago or 18 years ago. Uh, so let's move on a little bit in the future, 1990. Interestingly, I found uh, this uh, slide in one of the presentations by Jack Dongara, who gave a tutorial uh, at somewhere on parallel c computing for scientific applications. And what happened is in within two years was that we had real parallel machines that became available. And so because of the availability of real parallel machines, a lot of the theoretically defined uh, parallel languages were replaced by more pragmatic approaches, how to quickly use a parallel system. And if you look at this here, that's a quite amazing list because what Jack lists here is as number zero, sort of this, the holy grail of parallel languages, the automatic parallelizing compiler, uh, then compiler directives, then add-on to sequential languages, then standard parallel features in existing languages, then the special languages, those were the ones we had before, higher langu level languages like Lisp uh, as a historical set aside for Connection Machine 2 came out with Lisp as the way of programming parallel. And then new programming models with some obscure things such as spreadsheets and neural networks, which I don't know how they made this list. But anyway, what this list conveys that in 1990, there was actually even more confusion in a sense that it wasn't clear that we would use a new language, but there were all kinds of constructs, add-ons to existing languages, libraries, uh, compiler directives and so on. The interesting thing is here you see send receive and this long list of seven different items with some sub bullets. This is what turned into MPI, but it was just one of the choices. By 1990, it was not even clear that MPI would actually really become the choice 
uh, the, uh, for parallel system that is today. Uh, that's my own presentation from 1994. I traced the evolution further that by about 1993, 1994, we had more mature parallel systems like the Cray T3D and the CM5. And whereas the early systems had one way of expressing parallelism, now the system had multiple ways of expressing parallelism. For example, the connection machine CM5 allowed both message passing and data parallel with CM Fortran, but also allowing PVM, uh, which was an early message passing in, uh, uh, system. The T3D had other things, and I conjectured in 1994 that uh, MPI and HPF will be for survivors of this race, and we all know that HPF sort of faded away, did, uh, with the exception of the Japanese who took it in 95 and spent 10 years of research and made some successes out of it, uh, MPI was it. So what I said here is, is that we will come to a future environment which will have multiple architectures and multiple program models. Not all program models will fit on all architectures, but they will, of course, span several architectures. So that was close to the truth. I wasn't quite right. Um, as late as 1996, when I came to NERSC and uh, became NERSC director, we still had a very diverse set of tools. PVM was used, MPI, HPF, and some people used Shmem or Craft, which were some cray specific shared memory program models. It took until 1998 until MPI became the model of choice for parallel programming. So it was almost a 10-year process. And it's sort of an interesting thing in hindsight to reflect and see why was this so message passing library, which from a parallel programming language point of view, I mean, it's not even a language, it's not even uh, sort of, you can't even verify that MBI, MPI programs are correct, for example, uh, that this survived and it was simply just a pragmatic co of the program model with the architectures. Um, so I'm going to make a quick predict prediction in 2010 when petaflop system will come out. No, there will be no new program methodology. It will be MPI. Um, and it's pretty amazing that MPI is sort of today in where Fortran was in 1985 because everybody said, well, that's not the right program language. We have to change it. But every sa everybody said, well, but we still will program Fortran in 2000. I'm saying MPI is today exactly the same thing. We have a mid-1980s low-level message passing library that has been standardized in the mid-1990s. Now it's 10 years later. We're still using it, and we'll probably still use it because now we have so much legacy code for another 10 or 15 years until something better comes along. Here I'm preaching sort of nothing better will come along because there isn't that much research currently going on in programming languages or even in uh, any models of parallel computing if you look at it uh, nationwide in the computer science departments. So that was my statement. Oh, I sh jumped ahead again. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to sort of erase the tension. I hope that it was quick enough. So what is my number one accomplishment of the last 20 years? If you've seen it, blank it out, think about it. This is truly in the category of um, conceptual breakthroughs. And I think it's very important to understand this because you think in computer science or uh, there aren't that many sort of paradigm shifts or conceptual changes, but that truly was one in my mind and I explain it in, in a minute. So the number one accomplishment, and this may sound very strange to you if you're very well familiar with this and used it all, all along, is scaled speed up. And there was a paper that appeared in also in 1988 by John Gustafson, who is uh, at Sun, Gary Monter, who is now a consultant, and Bob Banner, who is still, uh, I think, at Sandia, those three were at Sandia, who ran some application programs on a 1024 processor, Hypercube, the NCube system at that time. And they said, well, if you really want to use a big computer with a large memory, of course you have to scale your problem with the size of computer that you're using. You don't want to run a program on one processor and then try to run the same program on 1024 processors. That doesn't make sense because you're getting killed by all the overhead in terms of paralyzing the code. Scale the problem with a computer. Very intuitive, natural notion today, but that was not understood before they published this paper. What was said at that time was sort of an argument that was an argument against massively parallel computing that roughly went as follows. It was an Amdahl's Law argument that said, uh, this is here from a presentation by Jack Walden around this time, and he said, well, uh, if you look at the parallel here versus the relative performance, and if you draw here a single scalar pro a single vector process, a Cray-1, and then you build a parallel system, moderately parallel, but with very heavy, expensive, and high-performing processes like the YMP, which is a little bit like 1.5 times faster than the one, 
has only eight processors, you will get, um, even for moderate parallelism, significant improvement over Cray-1. Those of you guys who pick a very low, not very powerful one megaflop or less processor and take 1024, 2048 together, you have to have almost perfect, embarrassingly parallel speed up before you beat a YMP. Or the way a mathematician friend of mine who argued this point with me said at this time, in mathematics, 1024 times nothing is still nothing. And that is, in a sense, what this argument is. You, you, you have to have uh, almost em mass embarrassingly parallel computing uh, going on before you can beat a traditional system. Uh, they actually went as far as there were people who proved, and there is a paper I actually all still also still have, which shows that the maximum speed up that you can ever obtain under some reasonable assumptions on your parallel computer is um, 704, and the systems up to size 6,931. So there were theoretical papers where they're out there that proved limits on parallel computing, and what this reasonable speed, reasonable assumption was, was that the co if you have parallel processes, that the cost of parallel processing uh, grows with a number of processes moderately, say like the log of the number of processes, very small constant, say factor of uh, 10,000, but yet, because you have a cost that grows with a number of processes, you never get um, maximum speed up. Of course, all of this assumes the fixed size, fixed problem size, and the scaled speed up really broke through this conceptual barrier and made it possible for people to say, yes, of course, if I run on a system, I want to use the whole system for my problem. I don't solve on a huge system a problem that I can solve on a single desktop processor. So I think that opened the way for parallel applications development, and without this change in understanding, the early success of parallel computing would not have happened. And it may sound, as I said, all important insights at one point uh, appear to be very trivial. And this is sort of like one of those insights that is very trivial now because when you start learning about parallel computing, you learn about scale speed up or weak scaling and you just build this in your thinking. You don't even think about it anymore because it's so natural. But it was a conceptual barrier this community had to overcome and break through in the late 90s, in late 80s, early 90s. There's sort of another thing I want to point out is, and this is in many of these things, you make these, you come to these insights and you have those breakthroughs only when you have actually real experimentation around a real system. The people who came up with this were the first ones who had access to a 1024 processor system, and that was very important. So now let me come to the second part of the talk, which will be somewhat shorter and hopefully more entertaining because it's pure speculation. I mean, it's very hard to talk about the future, so I try to be somewhat scientific on the past. I will be uh, more speculative on the future, of course. And my three challenges are sort of in chronological order, so they're not ranked in terms of any importance. So I would like to look at the near future, the midterm future, and the long-term future. So I think the near-term future is as follows. Uh, all of you have probably heard about the fact that uh, all the uh, microprocessor manufacturers have realized that pushing clock rates higher is going to be very expensive in terms of um, heating and other costs. And so we see clock rates to slow down. And consequently, we will get multi-core processors and uh, we will get scaling to many more processors than just a few thousand. Actually, we'll see scaling to maybe uh, hundreds of thousands of processors. Um, there are two consequences of this. One is, is that we will probably no longer be able to build in future parallel architectures interconnection networks like FETRI networks, which give at least a semblance of a um, topologically insensitive internet connection network. So you, have to, you can ignore nearest neighbor or neighbor relationships. And uh, of course, uh, we will continue to have the problem that processing and memory speeds are diverging and we have the memory wall. So, this is a much longer talk. I'm only going to talk about the first bullet because what I'm saying really is in the near term between now and 2010, we will have a, a number of technological issues that are very clear today and that we need to address. So if you look at applications today, where are applications today sort of in the big real world? So for example, at NERSC, um, we run in a production environment uh, a six processor IBM Power 3 system. And if you look at how much parallelism is used, there is an increase, and if you look at the green, these are 64 nodes, that's more than 1,000 CPUs that are used by single jobs. 
you see that this is over time increasing and the usage of one to seven nodes that's less than 64 process is decreasing over time. So I would say today in 2005, uh, we get a few teraflops sustained performance. We scale to about 512, 2024 processors. Future systems, and BlueGene is sort of the first harbinger of what will happen in the future, will have tens to hundreds of thousands of processors. So we're at least an order of magnitude away in terms of parallelism where we want to go in the future. It's actually very instructive to go back in time and see how much parallelism did we see in the past. And if you look at the highest parallel machine that existed, uh, say on the top 500 list, you see that for almost a decade up to BlueGene came along, uh, we had less than 10,000 processes available. And actually the highest parallel machine, the ASCII RET machine, was at Sandia inside a weapons lab and not accessible to research. So um, the average academic researcher probably had only access to parallelism at the level of a few hundred to maybe a thousand processors. <coughs> so we are far away, very far away from 10,000 to 100,000 processors. And I made this point before that access to real machines is often very, very important to uh, understand uh, scaling. Um, I'll say something on this one here because that shows one example on why scaling is so difficult to understand. This is a code called MATCAP, an astrophysics code that has been developed by Julian Borrell uh, at Berkeley Lab. And that was run on four different architectures, A, B, C, D, and was run with 16, 64, 256, and 1024 processors. And what is shown here is in terms of, as a pie chart, as part of the execution time, what is spent in calculation, MPI, and I.O. And this is the same code running scaled, speed up of course, so uh, the problem size is adjusted if you go to larger number of processes, but otherwise it's an identical code. And you can look at 2,024 processor machines and you see that they are significantly different in terms of how I.O. is scaling on this machine B versus how I.O. is scaling on machine A. Now I could do a little quiz and uh, say match the architecture to the behavior uh, one of these four machines is the Earth Simulator. One of them is the NERSC Power 3 with the Colony Interconnect. One is the an SGI Altix. Uh, and the last one is a Cray X1. Or one of them is a Cray X1, not, the, not necessarily the last one. And so the interesting thing is, is that actually this one here is the Earth Simulator. And so to a first glance, you would say, well, I.O. is horrible on the Earth Simulator, but the fact is, no, that's not really true. The processes are so fast that it's I.O. dominated. And then if you scale the calculation to larger systems, then the calculation takes over because it grows with order n cube. But those things are hidden in these charts. And so what I'm saying is, is that it's very difficult to give sort of scalability predictions over different types of architectures, even on a small range between 16 and 1024 process. I want to show another piece of uh, those of you who may work on tools or in visualization tools. This is how we currently visualize, um, say, parallel code execution. Green is when you're doing computing. Red is when you're doing MPI or communication. These black lines indicate messages being sent from one process to the other. So here are 16 processes lined up from uh, 0 to 15. And um, this is, in a way, how we look at it. Now, if you scale this, 64 where you get this picture. And if you scale it 256 process away is, takes a little while, looks this way. <laughs> of course, you can't see anything anymore. So a lot of our tools that have been developed are really tools that have been developed for small scale parallelism, not for large scale parallelism. The other irony of this one is this tool was run actually on 256 ways and it generated the 220 gigabyte trace file. So you get a supercomputing problem to analyze actually the uh, performance data. So we have to do something about this. So really, if we want to scale, and I, I'm, I haven't talked about the interconnect technology and memory access, that's sort of more detail for another talk, but these are really the challenges in the near future is for scaling to petaflop level. We will get the systems which will be built out of the lower uh, clock rate, lower frequency processors um, because of energy cost, because of energy dissipation. Uh, we will therefore go to a large number of parallel listen and we still haven't sort of as a community addressed scaling problems to say of the order of 100,000 process. I think that's actually good news for everybody in this room because just thinking on sort of my level of interest algorithm scaling, I believe that there is sort of a lot of research to be done to look at algorithms that scaled well 
could say a thousand processors. So I would say, for example, take multi-grid or sparse matrix calculations. You can scale them to a thousand processors, but scaling them to hundred thousand processors, maybe you need new ways of thinking about these very efficient algorithms on these highly parallel platforms. So let me talk about the period 2010 to 2018. In order to talk about this, I want to go back in history again and first point out that if you are still with me and that was very interesting for you, I would really suggest to look at the NRC report on the future of supercomputing. Jim here was a co-author and uh, Sue Graham was actually uh, one of the lead authors or chairs of that activity. That is a wonderful report which really summarizes the state of the art in supercomputing in 2005 and it's a very good introductionary book just to read to learn about this if you, if, if you get interesting. So that uh, report uh, talks about an ecosystem and the ecosystem of supercomputers. And uh, just as another little side effect, uh, this is where Google image search comes in handy. So you just say, I want a picture of an image of, of an ecosystem and then whoops, I get this from some Texas State University pond, which is a good image of what I think of an ecosystem being not a biologist. So what is an ecosystem for high performance computing? It is the insight that high performance computing is not just the platforms, architectures or software applications, but they all have an interplay and that's very important to understand. And so if we look in old days, the, in, in, uh, the ecosystem of 1988 in the ancient days truly was when Cold War and big oil spending was sort of a driving source. Supercomputers existed predominantly because of the weapons labs uh, needed these computers for doing weapon simulations and big oil was very heavily invested in supercomputers for geophysics and OSI simulations. You can actually look at this and what was sort of the architecture of choice, those were powerful vector supercomputers of the Cray 2 type that I showed before. And for me, this is sort of a time when dinosaurs roamed the earth, literally yeah. speaking. And of course, my, there are still of course friends of dinosaurs around. So I have to say that dinosaurs at their time were very well adapted agile creatures who fit very well in their environment. And that was definitely true about a Cray YMP in 1988. But, um, and what did they live on? Well, they lived on 20 years of Fortran application space in physics codes. I mean, don't forget that Fortran was around since the early 60s and some very important codes like, for example, Nastran were created in the late 60s and they were dominating a lot of the early vector computers. So this was a perfectly well-balanced ecosystem. The dinosaurs had lots of energy coming with big uh, purchases from Cold War uh, needs and the application was vector Fortran, which was suited for these architectures. So what happened? Uh, where are we in 2005? There was also all the people in there. Yes. The well, I don't, I, have, I don't have to, yeah, I should put the people in there, but I simplify, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what happened in 2005? In 2005, things have turned to a quite different ecosystem, almost like uh, the dinosaur extinctions. So we have on top of technology. It's no the massive investments for say Cold War spending, but it is the fact that supercomputing lives off commercial technology. And again, uh, the wonders of Google search produced this commercial off the shelf pile of PC image of uh, a, a way. I mean, this is sort of the overflowing PCs in the garage type thing. So commercial off the shelf is driving this. Um, what's the architecture? Well, clusters have taken over really. Most of the high-end systems are now clusters and here's an, my favorite image of Beowulf. So you could almost say of Beowulf slayed the Grendel the dinosaur and replaced it literally speaking. And I think there's actually something to it of the Beowulf as the slayer because it, this is a, a Beowulf image which looks more like a Japanese cartoon and uh, sort of alludes to sort of the self-image that many of the slash dot type uh, folks have of attacking those big dinosaurs of government sponsored supercomputers. Um, and of course by now we have 12 years of legacy MPI application base and the interesting thing is those three really interact very well with each other because MPI is a very simple program model which uh, fits very well to these loosely connected architectures that we get from commercial off the shelf clusters cluster software ties them all together. It's very inexpensive, so we get a very successful ecosystem change. And if 
looking at how we made this change, it was really that there was a massive R&D investment in the early 90s. HPC initiative, as I mentioned, was really at this point more than doubling the investment, was funding a lot of basic research in these technologies and made it available to a larger number of people and really set us off into, into the direction of MPPs. Of course, the external driver was the transition to CMOS. And all this happened at once. We really changed the ecosystem in a, within a few years at once. Um, ask. It, it is actually very stable today. Uh, Cray tried to reintroduce vector computers, the X1. I say the reintroduction of old species failed. And I get a lot of grief when I say Cray 1 failed, or the X1 failed. But what I mean is, is that it just wasn't a commercial success. It just didn't thrive. I mean, it, it did well on a few applications, but Cray didn't make a lot of money on this. More interesting is actually the fact that IBM, when they originally introduced the blue gene system, had a totally different system in mind. And the way the blue gene system evolved into the BGL system, and that's very interesting to look at, is that it evolved from a very different architecture into a very sort of run-of-the-mill cluster architecture that the BGL system is. Of course, it's very large has a new interconnection network, but it's still pretty much an MPI cluster. So I'd say this is, of course, made for a different audience. The system looks well, so why are people not happy? Why was the National Academy really concerned about the future of supercomputing? Well, because this system does not address the true high-performance computing needs of the very high end. It addresses a large number of needs of industrial customers. It is a great environment for academician to start, run parallel applications, develop application software, develop system software. Uh, but it's not going to address, this type of model does not address the real high-end needs. And this is the core of uh, the concern about supercomputing today. The problem is the industry has now changed. And this is coming back, what's the problem between 2010 and 2018? The, the high-performance computing industry is a six to eight billion dollar industry. Uh, it's seven and a quarter billion in 2004 for clusters and all these other things. Traditional supercomputers are $800,000, so a very small piece. And so there are some efforts like the DARPA HPCS program, but the real challenge is can we change this? And I believe that by about 2015, we need a new paradigm. We probably see these problems when we try to scale to 10,000 processors. We'll see that the architecture, in particular this sort of loosely coupled cluster-like architecture is the wrong architecture for highly, very highly parallel systems, but where are we going to change it to? How are we going to do the software? That's all the big question, the challenge for the mid years. So the last challenge, and I'll try to come in exactly at 5 o'clock, is for the last seven years, and I put this from 2018 to 2025. If everything holds well, then I will retire in 2018. So I say this is the problem for my children and grandchildren at that time. Of course, in reality, I don't expect to retire in 2018 because we all know how our retirement will go. Um, so I will probably work until 2025 anyway. So I still have to worry about this. Um, basically, it's the flattening of Moore's Law. And what I mean by flattening of Moore's Law, there, there are two or three charts. So I'm not, in, and I hope that maybe somebody here can be more informed than I am, I'm, I'm not a expert in semiconductor technology and I don't know where things going but I just show two simple charts which show that it cannot go on forever and the first chart is from Joel Birnbaum from HP already shown in the year 1999 and this is really looking at the future looking at the number of electrons per device and looking at the transistors per chip and of course we increase the number of transistors per chip following the Moore's law curve on this is a logarithmic scale so we get from 4 million to 16 billion more and more transistors per chip. So in 2005, we're sort of in the 1 to 4 billion. That was a prediction which is pretty much uh, a little bit ahead, but not that far ahead. And the fact is simply that the number of electrons on a whatever, 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter by 2 centimeter square is fixed. It's not going to change. So no matter, I mean, you can make these a little bit bigger, but more or less, you get less and less electrons per transistor, and at one point you will hit a point when you have more transistors than electrons on a chip. So obviously something got to go. And we don't know what, but it's obvious to me that uh, this, scale, this type of scaling cannot. So it's a very simple argument. There's sort of another argument, and this is um, Eric de Benedictis' argument, and there's a website called setaflops.org, uh, which is the setaflop is 10 to the 21 flops. So 
Uh, you'll find a lot of information on this one. And he said, well, what it is is that you drive with your car uh, from the Bay Area to Lake Tahoe, and you tune in your favorite FM station, and as you drive up, and by the time you pass Sacramento, your FM station has disappeared. And this is because you have a fixed strength signal, and the further you go away, the less uh, signal you get because of the distance, and the more noise you get. And at one point, noise takes over, and you don't get any more signal. Well, the same thing is true when you shrink um, a when you shrink your transistor. So if you have a fixed size die and you increase the number of gates and you have the same amount of power in the chip and you get less and less power per transistor and at one point you get noise from electrons which wipe out your signal. So same argument, just looking at some different parameters. So sooner or later something got to give. I mean you can also say simply exponential growth forever is simply not possible. Um, if you look at the semiconductor roadmap from ITSR, see that if you look at some, they sort of say, where do we want to be in 2010, 45 nanometers, 32 nanometers, 22 nanometers by 2016, and then say, what needs to be done to get to these levels? And you see that without me understanding any of these, I just see a lot of red, which means manufacturer solutions are not known today. So you see that in many of the 2010, air, uh, which is fairly near term, uh, uh, manufacturing technologies, they are at this point still research agenda. So we don't know if that will be successful. There are sort of this expectation it worked in the past, so it will work in the future. Um, there are a lot of alternative technologies out there. And uh, you've heard about quantum computers for sure. You heard about biological computers, DNA computers. There, there's optical, there's whatever, all kinds of other things. We have all kinds of interesting characteristics in terms of energy dissipation and uh, switching speed and they're all relatively known and can be put on this chart. I find this chart very interesting. But um, the real question is who is working on this? And the point is, is that we're only about 15 years away from say the flattening at least of traditional Moore's law and there doesn't seem to be a broad scale research effort to focus on some of those potential replacement technologies for CMOS. Now, there are successes. I mean, you hear the people at Hewlett Packard talking about their uh, nanotechnology efforts for uh, replacing memory. Uh, there are a number of small companies that use nano as memory to produce memory chips. There is quite a bit of work going on in quantum computing. We make gradual progress. There are interesting questions on whether quantum computers can actually do the type of scientific simulations that we're interested in. So there's incremental progress, but what I want you to sort of think about it is, is that we all live more or less in Silicon Valley and Moore's law has been driving this economic engine for the last 50 or 60 years. And here we are at a fairly foreseeable 15 year distance to a big cliff, yet we happily sort of move on and expect Moore's law will continue and we won't fall off the edge of a cliff. And so, as a thought exercise, I said, think about what the computer industry would be like if there wouldn't be Moore's Law. So you wouldn't buy computers anymore because they're better performing. So you would buy them like cars because your old one breaks. Uh, your kid spilled some water on your keyboard and you finally have to get rid of that laptop or something like this. So it's a completely different in industry model if you don't have the performance increases anymore. And I think the whole industry will substantially change. The way I bring this home to people is, is that we're acting here today, here in the Bay Area, like Detroit did in 1958 or 59, when just everything was well with the car industry. And nobody would have thought there's a 1973 with an oil crisis and when suddenly American cars were no longer the most energy efficient and Detroit turned from a booming town into what it is today, sort of a somewhat, I hope I don't step on anybody's toes from Michigan, but uh, it's not, a I mean, downtown Detroit is probably not the place you want to live. I mean, and so I don't, I, I, I would like to project on where San Jose or Silicon Valley will be in 20 years when Moore's laws end. So probably the exciting stuff will happen in China or in India. And so this is really why I think this is really important to think about it. And I'm very amazed that so few people actually think about it. There is no concentrated program uh, to help research in that area. I mean, this is one of the great economic challenges for us. This is a basis of our wealth and it's sort of drifting along. So that's what I said here. 
after 50 years of exponential growth, how can the industry adjust to a no growth scenario? That's a sort of an unknown thing for the computer industry. Of course, they are optimists who say a replacement technology will be found. It will sort of pop out in some of those five or six things. Maybe in five years it will be found, but still, uh, it's still, it's probably better to do some more intensive research than this. So the three future challenges in the short then are, to recap, is in the near term future up to about 2010 is how do we scale to tens of thousands of processors. In the mid term is how we change the ecosystem because I don't think that the current type of system, the cluster system, will be really suitable for large scale, uh, more than hundreds of thousands of processor type uh, environments. And the third and biggest challenge is in the long term future how we can deal with the flattening of Moore's law for semiconductor devices. So thank you. Yes. Um, so, what, could you give us an example of insight that has occurred because of it can be traced to visualization? Other than, I mean, you've already mentioned yes. funding, which follows some increased popularity yes. in the field, but and that, that is important. But I think you're thinking of something a little more sort of mundane. Um, anecdotally, I know a couple of instances were visualization has been very helpful in sort of code development, debugging, and so on, that people looked at the output of a simulation. And a lot of scientists have sort of an understanding of what to expect in terms of a physical phenomena. Look at the visualization and say, this doesn't look right. And go back and then look at why it doesn't look right and understand that there was, a mis there was an error in the code. So I've heard this very often. I think there are a few examples uh, in, for ex one, st one case I know is in terms of the oil industry where they build an interactive system where you could, pill, could sort of put wells into an oil field and then look at uh, the actual production. And again, by just looking at this, uh, people have the sort of the understanding of how an oil field should work and could use that to, um, in a non-mathematical optimization way, optimize uh, well locations. In terms of scientific insights, sort of something that would make a scientific headline or cover of science, I'm currently pressed for a story. Criticism. Yes. 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 I. Yeah. Without looking at the outputs and saying you know, you need to be obvious to you know, this or not, I'm not quite sure how that would be in, in more recent days than the, the hurricane. Yeah. That's sort of a, of interest. There's a pattern recognition and they want maybe they look at it and then figure out how to find that more systematic. Yeah, that, that's sort of the same example where I said where the visualization helps to see how close a code is to being actually correct and or at a global level understanding is correct. There, there's sort of another point, and this is that possibly visualization is going to turn into a different direction in sort of the near future, and this is that we gotta take the human possibly back out of the loop, and the issue is much more data analysis, data mining, and um, tools which would actually do this in a uh, less sort of cognition-based but more rigorous mathematical way of finding structure in large data. So the, w what Jim mentioned, you can look at data set and say there's a hurricane in there, you see a vortex, but then actually what you would like to do is automate this and look at uh, a couple of hundred gigabytes of climate data output and find all the hurricanes that were in there. Yes. Yes. Like either? 
Um, well, I think we should try to do it. I mean, this is this is this is probably this is probably a perfect example where computational simulation can help us uh, sort of testing out a multi-billion-dollar design, which is unique, which hasn't been tried before, and where the fusion simulation community has made a significant progress in, in sort of having uh, partial solutions. I, I think building to complete system is, is sort of a next step up in complexity. So I. I think it can be done, but it's, a, it's one of those big challenges similar to the nuclear weapon simulations that are done in, in the classified world. So yes, now how much algorithms? Yes, the, uh, I didn't show, uh, there, there are other slides, so I have a set of slides uh, very similar in nature that David Keyes had put together where he shows that in other areas how much algorithms con have contributed. And you can pretty much say that uh, over the last uh, two decades where I'm looking at algorithm research contributed equally to hardware research to first order. It's harder to quantify because it's coming at unpredictable steps. So people can work on something and nothing may happen for 10 years and then suddenly you have sort of a complexity breakthrough and find something which is better complexity. I actually have Bruce Cohen's slide somewhere, if I could find it now. Okay. I wanted to ask a related question. Uh, I think part of the ecosystem is, is what the application and the, and the uh, grand challenges are. You talked about how in the 80s it was Cold War, meaning weapon simulation, not oil. Yes. Um, so talk about sort of in the context of these different eras. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you look at today, uh, as uh, what I mentioned before, the weapons codes that have been developed, for example, and this is, a, this is a good example because you really have now technology in place which replaces, and uh, the, our colleagues at Livermore Los Alamos are convinced about it, which replaces nuclear testing. So this is a very big uh, progress because uh, in addition to all the environmental and political cost of a nuclear test, I mean, a nuclear test simply costs several hundred million dollars, so if you can replace that with computer simulations, it's a big progress. I think if you look more in civilian uh, world, climate is certainly the next big challenge. And um, if you look at what we currently can do in terms of climate modeling, there are very simple extrapolations in terms of more refinements, more physics, uh, including the carbon cycle and all this, that quickly are all these multiplicative changes that put climate uh, requirements, if you want to do really understanding the carbon cycle and get our, uh, get a better model in place, there are easily a factor of 1,000 computational requirements within the next couple of years. So th these are all old applications. And then there's a question, what is their new applications? I'm actually sort of intrigued about um, some recent work that has been done. So I'll tell you my favorite. I, I've seen the work done by Henry Markham at uh, EPFL Lausanne, and he has put together a team of researchers to really build a computational model of the brain. And he's doing this from first principles. So he's looking at neurons and how neurons are really switching with synapses, and he's building this bottom up. And he thinks that in about 10 years, he may have a large enough computer and well understood modeling that he could model the brain and then model their things such as epileptic seizures or possibly diseases and find, um, so from a systems point of view, solutions to these problems. So I think there are a couple of people who see the, the future of high performance computing now because the technology has become much less expensive uh, and, and we will come up with some breakthrough new applications. Yeah. 
so the the six to eight billion, of course, includes all the clusters. So the biologists just have to scale up to very large problems. The one I mentioned is one of the few examples of really using the largest system today for biologists. Um, okay, any other questions? Or Jim? Thank you. Thanks for putting this together on a short notice. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's much work being done um, with the investigating AI for your CBT. No, actually not. And I think that's one of the current shortcomings that those two communities are fairly disjoint. Mm -hmm. So thinking machines, as you may know, was originally designed as an AI machine. That's why Lisp was the program model, the yeah. programming language of choice. But that was sort of, at that time, what happened was that AI declined, there was no more funding, and all the high-end computing focused on the engineering scientific applications. So yeah, so what's yeah. the definition of AI that has morphed over time? Yeah, what, ha what is AI now is if you say machine learning or uh, all these type of things, even in those areas there isn't that much use of supercomputers today. There's but a lot of computation, but not There's a lot of computation, but not the very high end. Um, Google, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So th there is. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest supercomputer user in the world uh, is, is, is per the NSA, which does data mining. And yeah. And, uh, True. And so forth. So that's, the, that's one important there's a lot of. Yeah. And if you look at Google, for example, Google is not saying what they really do. I mean, they well, run the, huge one clusters. Of the, um, but technical directors once commented that it would easily yeah. be in the top three. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Although now it might have fallen behind with the blue green coming mm -hmm. up, especially because there are more coming up soon. Yeah. And now. Now it's like 260k plus or so, right? Or, well, that's counting um, the application yeah. specific. Yes, yeah. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sort of surprised that <laughs> supercomputing ignores a lot of applications which might need it, but. True. I mean, I looked at, I actually have in another talk this slide, but I looked at a list of applications in 1992 mm -hmm. and then look at what is today, and the list from 1992 and today are almost the same. I mean. 1992 people were talking already about biology applications. Mm -hmm. so, so the only thing which may have changed over the last 10 or 15 years in terms of additional things are what you might call today these homeland security applications, that is mm -hmm. data mining or looking at large databases. One, one good reason for that is those applications, even though what you explained was from physics and biology in 1992, and today their goals are much more ambitious. Yeah. And, and you can sort of scale those problems up 